Good evening, everyone. My name is Ala Marshinka, and I'm the president of the Aurora Philosophy Institute. This evening, we welcome Ronan Grunberg and his daughter, Megan Bidal Grunberg, as our speakers. Ronan, as you all know, is a retired educator and a vice president technology of the API. As for Megan, she, I suppose, is a following in her father's footsteps, at least to some extent, as she is now a teacher at the Linden School in Toronto. She is a graduate of Queen's University with a degree in film and media studies and bachelor in education. And this, of course, is highly relevant to tonight's talk. The philosophy of film. Welcome, Megan and Ronan. All right. So uh, today we're going to talk about um, philosophy and film. And the main question that we're going to ask is, is the medium of film an appropriate one for illustrating slash doing philosophy? Now, as you can see, I'm dividing the question into illustrating and doing. And this is an intentional division, and I'm going to explain uh, why I'm doing this a bit later. But first, I need to tell you a little bit about how film and philosophy intersect in my personal life. So I'm going to start early on at the age of 15, which is when I began, began to become interested in philosophy. Um, and what motivated my interest was uh, a teacher who kind of turned me uh, onto philosophy, but also just my own deep sense that there was a lot that I didn't know. And being a curious person, I believed that philosophy had the potential to give me insight into myself and the nature of reality. And the questions that I had were pretty typical of a 16, 15, 16 year old. There were questions like, why am I here? Who am I? What is consciousness? What is the nature of reality? What is death? What is identity? What is justice? Is justice man-made or something that exists in the very fabric of the universe? Is it possible that what I perceive with my senses is an illusion? Does evil exist? Are people naturally good or evil? Is there an ultimate meaning to existence or is it meaningless? Now. The very first philosophical text that I read that I remember was Jean-Paul Sartre's Being and Nothingness. Probably not the best text to start with as a 15 year old. Uh, nevertheless, that's the one that I read. And I remember being very puzzled by that text uh, by statements like the following. I must be without remorse or regrets as I am without excuse. For from the instant of my upsurge into being, I carry the weight of the world by myself alone without help, engaged in a world for which I bear the whole responsibility without being able, whatever I do, to tear myself away from this responsibility from, for an instant. So as a 15 year old, I wasn't 100% sure what that meant, but it was clear to me that it involved being aware, self-aware, and taking responsibility for one's actions. Now, it took a fair amount of reading and a significant uh, amount of mental work to understand the essential concepts proposed by Sata and other philosophers that I was reading. I remember reading Descartes, and again, not really understanding everything there. Uh, it, it was a very cerebral, uh, activity. So while reading Sartre and other philosophers, I also went to see lots of films. And while I found philosophy difficult and puzzling, films were always, always a pleasurable experience. Even films that dealt with difficult ideas were reasonably easy to digest. Because instead of speaking in general terms, and trying to formulate universal uh, truths using difficult words and jargon as, as philosophy 
often did. Films were much more about particular things. The best films dealt with specific issues and problems and seemed to pose questions that all of us as human beings have to deal with. And the issues that they talked about were issues that I could relate to, issues like love and identity and justice, uh, questions of right and wrong, questions about death and the afterlife. Um, almost all films that I watch um, tended to ask questions about the following things. Almost all the films that I saw. What is human nature? Um, are humans uh, good or bad? Are human beings both good and bad? Can human beings change? Uh, are human beings naturally moral? Is mor mor morality fictional or is it real? So as you can see, the two disciplines, which apparently you know, on the surface seem very different, uh, philosophy and film, do intersect. They ask similar questions. Both um, are interested in the question of what it means to be human and how one should live one's life. So later, when I was teaching philosophy, uh, it seemed natural to me to use films as an illustrative tool for philosophical concepts, an illustrative tool. And I did so often because it made difficult ideas much easier for my students, high school students, to understand and discuss. So I wasn't teaching university, but for high school students, film were a wonderful stepping stone to difficult uh, ideas. So now I'm just gonna very briefly distinguish between philosophy through film versus film as philosophy, okay? And it's a significant difference because we're gonna basically talk about that, uh, Megan and I, throughout the presentation. So there are two ways in which film can be used philosophically. So first of all, it can be used as a resource to give examples and illustrate philosophical positions, ideas, and questions. And this is the primary way in which I used film when I taught. It was to illustrate something that I wanted the students to understand um, in some graphic way. So I used films to illustrate it. But a second approach is to think of film as a medium for philosophizing. So doing philosophy with film. So using the language of film to contribute to original philosophical knowledge. And um, the first way of doing it to give um, films as a way of illustrating, you know, everybody pretty much accepts that this is possible. We can find many films that have philosophical themes and ideas in, in the film. Uh, and it's pretty much accepted by all philosophers that you, know, you can use films in this way. Um, but film as philosophy, also known as FAP, uh, that is the actual acronym that is used uh, by philosophers who uh, think uh, about film as philosophy, this is much more debatable. And the general argument against it is that the very nature of film, its specificity and narrative structure is contrary to the way philosophy approaches knowledge. Because films deal with specific situations and events and do not really touch on uni universe, the universal principles, some argue that they are epistemologically questionable. And one person who argues that they are epistemologically questionable is Murray Smith. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a reference that you can look uh, at later on where he actually discusses this. Now, those philosophers who argue 
that films can be uh, philosophical generally discuss the following questions. And one person who does this is a man by the name of Thomas Wartenberg, and I'll talk about him in more detail a little bit later. But the kinds of things that uh, the fat crowd discuss include things like the nature of film. You know, it's ontological sort of uh, nature, it's being. Uh, they discuss what constitutes film. So what makes a film a film? Uh, it's underlying grammar. You know, if you take a video camera and you start shooting things uh, randomly, is that a film? Well, probably not. So what constitutes film? What makes a film a film? Is film art? How does art differ from philosophy? And does art and philosophy share a common ground? How do films differ from other narrative forms? And finally, and very importantly, um, they ask questions like, do films have metaphysical significance? Do they mirror in an accurate way the nature of the real? Or do films obfuscate and impose an illusory veil over reality? Okay, so this brings me to uh, a, a, a central question, which is the question of specific versus universal. So I, as I already hinted at, as I already suggested, um, one argument against philosophy through film is the idea that films only deal in specific narratives, images, and scenarios, whereas philosophy concerns itself with universal truths. And since by definition, film is about particular experiences and people, the argument is that it has a very difficult time expressing and arguing universal truths, which are at the heart of philosophy. And this is set Plato's central argument against particulars. For Plato, particulars are objects of the senses and of belief, whereas forms, transcendent forms are universal and are objects of knowledge that are grasped by the intellect, the intellect alone. The senses cannot grasp knowledge. Only the intellect can grasp knowledge independent of the senses. And since films deal with particulars and sense experience and don't deal with universals, they cannot give us knowledge. And this is what he said. Um, we must make a distinction and ask, what is that which always is and has no becoming? And what is that which is always becoming and never is? That which is apprehended by intelligence and reason is always in the same state. But that which is conceived by opinion with the help of sensation and without reason is always in the process of becoming and perishing and never really is. And films are, for Plato, would have been a form of opinion, but they would not give any knowledge. So uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Megan, who is going to uh, respond to some of the things that I've said. All right. Well, I'm going to jump in there because I think, you know, everything that was said was all good, but I am going to bring it back right back to Plato's idea of philosophy, which is really that philosophy is to discover the universal nature of reality. And films, they can really give us a glimpse into very specific people's experience, thoughts, and feelings, whether that be of the filmmaker or the characters portrayed in the film. And through the visual and immersive medium of film, we actually do more than just listen to different perspectives we momentarily experience that reality. Uh, and when we exit the theater uh, and we come back to our own reality, we often reflect on what actually brought us those mirrored emotions. So if you go to the next slide, I ask myself, how did I manage to feel so much sorrow when Joel got his memory erased in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind? Or if you go to the next slide, <clears throat> 
how did I feel so infatuated when Theodore fell in love with the artificial intelligence in his phone during the movie Her? Or in the next movie, um, where I was absolutely terrified when Chris is sent into the sunken place in the movie Get Out. I never experienced those situations. So if you go to the next slide, I really naturally, I become reflective and I ask, what is the universal experience that allowed me to identify with these characters? So for me, it really is exactly the specificity paired with the immersive nature of film that allows us to reflect on universal experience and the universal nature of reality. Well, I'm convinced, but anyway, I'm going to take the opposing view and, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the uh, negative stuff or the uh, opposition to film uh, as philosophy and even um, philosophy through film. And I'm gonna specifically uh, talk about uh, Plato's allegory of the cave, because Plato is often dis discussed and used when talking about film as not being able to do philosophy. Um, and the allegory of the cave is a reference uh, that is often made. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Plato's allegory, although I think probably most of us here are, um, it is a narrative uh, in Plato's Republic where Plato tells the story of prisoners trapped in a cave. And the prisoners are unaware that they are in prison or that they are in a cave. For the prisoners, the cave is everything that exists and it is the only reality. Inside the cave, the prisoners are able to see the shadows of things reflected on the cave wall. And the prisoners believe that reality is in fact the shadows projected on the wall. They don't realize that there's another reality there. They think that the shadows are the only re reality. And Plato's essential message there seems to be uh, that visual imagery and representations are inadequate as a source of knowledge because the uh, prisoners in the cave are being deceived, even though they think they, they have knowledge, they actually don't have any knowledge. And more importantly, uh, what Plato uh, is suggesting is that philosophical enlightenment requires thinking and critical reflection. Um, you can't get knowledge by relying on how things appear to us. And uh, the shadows are mere appearances. And you can't get knowledge from appearances because they are constantly changing, they are illusory, uh, and they can't be a source of knowledge because they don't really touch on anything universal. Philosophical enlightenment, according to Plato, can only come when we escape from the cave and go out into the sunlight where we can see real objects. And experience, sense experience, says Plato, only gives us access to shadows. To grasp the true nature of reality, which is the proper task of philosophy, we have to break free from dependence on sense experience and use reason alone. Now, I'm not going to show you this little video, but if you are interested in learning more about um, the Allegory of the Cave, there's a little video that I put on the API website, which you can go to if you wish, and uh, you can get a little more information on it. Cinematic imagery, films, mass media in general, TV, streaming, YouTube, and so on, are reminiscent of Plato's Cave. Because just as in Plato's Cave, in the cinema, we also sit in a darkened space, transfixed by images removed from the real world. Watching films, we are a bit like Plato's prisoners. Cinema audiences 
watch images projected onto a screen in front of them, which are like the shadows in Plato's allegory. So on the surface, at least, it seems that films are of no help whatsoever for an understanding of philosophy. Um, because films give us mere shadows, appearances, which are far removed from what the real world is really like. So if the goal of philosophy is to discover the nature of reality, metaphysics, then relying on mere appearances is going to take us away from truth and knowledge, which is epistemology, rather than bring us closer to it. However, and this is a very important however, maybe this complete dismissal of philosophy through film is a bit premature because it is a total dismissal of film's potential. While some films are nothing more than an entertaining distraction and cannot be used as a source of enlightenment, other films are much more insightful about what it means to be human and the nature of reality. So instead of a monolithic dismissal of films, film as philosophy requires us to be selective. And that's what philosophers who argue that film can do philosophy say. Yes, not all films are philosophical and not all films can do philosophy, but it doesn't make sense to throw away all films. Use the films that can enlighten us and don't worry about the ones that can't. If we carefully examine individual films, we will see that they have, some films have the potential of cutting through prevailing ways of thinking, social practices, and institutions. In fact, films can undermine our false beliefs through playfulness, irony, and subversion. So I'm going to kind of flip it over to a film as philosophy and, you know, my argument for film as philosophy, at least, and I'd love to hear your perspective on it as well. Um, so as we know, you know, film is an inherently visual medium. Um, so it, it lends itself to strains of philosophy that culture has forced into the visual sphere, um, most notably feminist philosophies, which which is what I'll be focusing on in this section. Um, and so when discussing the intersection of film philosophy and feminism, um, it's impossible not to start with the contributions of Laura Mulvey, who is a British film theorist, um, whose theories are influenced by the likes of Sigmund Freud and Jacques Lacan. Um, and in her 1975 essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, Mulvey coined and described the concept of the male gaze, which if you go to the next slide, um, the male gaze in short is explained as the way that mainstream media objectifies women, shows um, showing the female body through a heter heterosexual male lens, um, where feminine subjects are shown more as passive non-actors, uh, secondary to the active male characters. Now, essentially, the male gaze sees the female body as something for the heterosexual male, or you could say patriarchal society as a whole um, to watch, conquer, uh, and possess and use to further their goals. And so Mulvey really believes that women are in fact uh, the bearer of meaning and not the maker of meaning which suggests that women are not placed in a role where they can take control of a scene. And instead they're simply put there to be observed uh, from an objective, objectified point of view. Uh, and this inequality enforces the ancient and the outdated idea of men do the looking and women are to be looked at. Now in film, typical examples of the male gaze include medium close-up shots of women from over a man's shoulder, shots that pan and fixate on a woman's body uh, and scenes that frequently occur which show a man actively observing a passive woman. Uh, so if you go to my next slide, you can see I, I've put in a few examples of just stills from some movies that maybe you have seen. Uh, 
This is from Rear Window uh, by Hitchcock, which you can see there are segmented bodies if you go to the next slide as well. The Graduate, of course, um, again, segmented female bodies. If you go to the next slide, maybe you've seen um, the James Bond movies where we have the active male with the, the passive females. And to the next slide, more recent um, the Transformers movie uh, by Michael Bay, where we have, you know, the male fantasy or the fetishization of the female form. So if we keep going, um, patriarchal system, culture, cultural systems um, make the visual, um, the visual medium of film really integral to feminist uh, theories and the philosophies that follow. Um, they really couldn't be done separately. Uh, so it truly is film as philosophy if we keep going into some examples. Now, films can do more than simply, I think you can go to the next slide there, Dad. Here? Uh, oh, nope, sorry, you can go back. Uh, great. Now, films can do more than simply echo dominant ideologies that I, I explained there. So while Mulvey's theory of the male gaze really pinpointed those dominant ideologies, um, filmmakers have since been responding and directly philosophizing through the very medium of their own films uh, and creating new philosophies of their own. So most directly is the philosophy of the female gaze. And as you might expect, the female gaze gives women a chance to look. Uh, women are the active subjects instead of the passive objects. Um, and while these statements seem pretty straightforward, uh, there is more to the female gaze than just reversing the male gaze. So uh, this could mean that the female gaze is not simply interested in asserting female dominance. Rather, it centers on these three key tenets. Uh, exposing how it feels to be the object of a gaze. So the camera, the camera actually speaks out as a receiver of a gaze uh, and in a sense is self-reflective or it is even critical, critically reflective on its own point of view. It can return the gaze. So acknowledging, that the, acknowledging the male gaze and actively making women subjects rather than passive objects and three, that bodies are used as a way to portray emotions and the film frame is used in a way that invokes personal emotion rather than just viewing it on screen. Now, uh, I'm gonna, I think, move on to exploring a film that would, that I would call the originator of the female gaze, um, where this philosophy was first developed um, directly in film. Um, so, Dad, I don't know if you want to jump directly to that. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Yeah, there we go. So, okay. Great. Um, so, I'm going to talk about a film, um, one of the most notable films um, that uses the female gaze, which is Jean Dillman, 23 Commerce Quay, uh, 1018 Brussels, a very long title, which I will just be referring to as Jean Dillman. I don't know if anyone has seen it before um, or even heard of it. Um, but in brief, Jean Delman is a film about a widowed housewife who spends her days consumed with repetitive domestic work, uh, while also keeping herself financially afloat through occasional prostitution. Uh, and it's only when small interruptions in her daily routine occur um, that she takes some unexpected measures uh, to correct it. And so I'll leave it at that to avoid any spoilers. Um, but if you go to the next slide, so just to give some background, this film was directed by Chantal Ackerman, um, and it was released the same year as Mulvey's essay on the male gaze, um, so in 1975. And it arguably does the groundwork for establishing and philosophizing on the female gaze. So rather than just searching for positive images and representations of women on screen, uh, filmmakers, pioneering filmmakers like uh, Ackerman wanted to intervene into the actual formal workings of cinema 
to radicalize the cinema apparatus and deconstruct ideological codes from within. So in other words, if you go to the next slide, um, formal construction must change, not just the content to create these philosophies. Um, to use traditional construction would be to, uh, and I quote, remain within the master's house, as said by Audre Lorde. So Ackerman uses her camera as a philosophical and cultural intervention. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, uh, her change in, in formal construction can be seen in her use of what is called the pre-aesthetic. Now, the pre-aesthetic is uh, supposedly in and of itself aesthetic rather than being aestheticized. Uh, so formally in her film, uh, this looks like long takes and medium shots of Jean Dillman in her home with little filmic dis with as little filmic distortion as possible. Uh, the frame is really controlled by Dillman's actions and gestures uh, and, and her looks and importance is really placed on traditionally devalued actions. So the pre-aesthetic essentially values the image before a traditionally aestheticized image that we would typically see in movies. If you go to the next slide, um, you know, such as a woman sitting at a table rather than the actual action that ensues that we would normally see in a film. And so myself and others would argue that, you know, this film philosophizes directly through its use of the film medium. Uh, and it's undeniably important to film history. Um, now, that being said, it's not the most traditionally accessible film since it runs for four hours uh, and is in a traditional sense, not, uh, it's a bit slow paced, uh, not to deter you from watching it. Um, but there definitely are other films which are more mainstream and accessible that uh, utilize the female gaze. But uh, when we're talking about film as philosophy and original philosophy as film, uh, it felt right to go with the originator where this was one of the first times that these ideas were discussed directly in film um, before or at the same time as it was written and discussed uh, in academia.